Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. We may have a few late attendees, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, thank you so much for joining us in this afternoon's webinar produced by the Conservation Cropping Systems Initiative. We're focusing on agrivoltaics today, and we have joining us Byron Komenek, who is out of Colorado, a farmer who has installed solar panel panels on his own farm, and they generate enough electricity to power up some 300 houses to use in a year. He'll give you more details about his operation. We also have Dr. Stacy Peterson, who is the Energy Program Director for the National Center for Appropriate Technology. She leads a team of some 30 or plus partners and stakeholders, and among her other projects at NCAT, it includes the AgriSolar Clearinghouse. We'll get you more information on that in just a little bit. And finally, we have Dr. Greg Baron Gafford out of the University of Arizona, and he's for at least the last eight years has been building the field of agrivoltaics, or that concept of co-locating agriculture and solar farms. He too leads a diverse team, and you know one of his concentrations is to keep or bring back ag production and the understory of photo photovoltaic panels. Now we are taking questions today. You can either pop them in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, our CCSI team will be monitoring that, and all of our panelists have opted to answer those questions towards the end, but don't hesitate to start popping them in the chat or the Q&A function. And with that, I am going to turn my video off, and I'm going to turn that over to you, Greg. Great, thank you. Just to start, since we're in Zoom, everybody can hear me okay? Anybody a thumbs up? Thanks, Anod. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for uh, welcoming the three of us here to speak. It's, uh, it's an honor to speak with practitioners and farmers and energy producers. Uh, we're, we're loving being a part of this exploding trend of thinking about optimal land use and responsible land use. Um, today, we're going to be talking about agrivoltaics, um, which we'll define uh, more broadly in a moment as a climate smart and conservation cropping practice, um, keeping in line with the theme that um, Lisa's organization represents. And we use these terms climate smart and conservation cropping intentionally because we are talking about intentional marriage of renewable energy and food production in a way that is sensible, is responsive to the needs of certain areas and is dialed to create an optimal system, whether that optimization is more in favor of certain types of food crops, certain levels of energy practice. So I'm Greg Berry. I also work at Biosphere 2, this um, place that you may have heard about. Um, sometimes people refer to it as like the biodome, but that's this illustration of this structure in the background. In the foreground, you can see examples of how we're growing crops in a traditional full sun setting and in the shade of the solar array. Um, what's really great about the group of us that are here today is that I'm from the university. Uh, so I represent very much a research and development into how plants perform in different shady environments around the country, um, how we might work to conserve water, direct water off these panels to do good work for us. Um, but I very much come from the research end of things. Byron um, comes from the practitioner side of things, an actual landowner. Uh, so he'll talk about someone who inherited land and suddenly found himself, as so many people will, I believe in the coming decades, of inheriting farmland and wondering what's the, what's the best climate smart conservation way of uh, being productive members of the community. And then finally, um, Stacey Peterson will wrap it up for us by um, sharing what the Department of Energy has invested in as a resource uh, for you to follow up with uh, beyond today. But I'm going to start by defining agrivoltaics. If you haven't heard this term, it's simply a mashup of the word agriculture and photovoltaics. We take the agri part of this production, the photovoltaics, uh, the voltaics part, where photovoltaics is just renewable energy production from solar panels. So getting the lingo out of the way right from the start. 
we were being interviewed by this uh, magazine, Green America, a couple of years ago. And one of the uh, reporters said, oh, I get it. You're just a farm that harvests the sun twice. And how beautiful is that simplicity? We are, we are talking about ways of harvesting the sun twice. First in that overstory of solar capture for energy production, and then leaving some sun for the crop production underneath. And depending on where you're coming in from around the country, we know that there's a balance in terms of how much sun the plants need in that understory versus how much they're trying to avoid for that sunlight. I'm based in Arizona and a lot of times we, we try to hide out in the shade, especially in the summer. And that can be true in almost any region. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Agrical takes can look like a lot of different things. Uh, the picture on the left is from Byron's uh, farm that you'll see a little bit later, which looks like elevated panels just a bit farther off the ground so you can do more with them. In some places we're talking about a moderate canopy of solar that it's elevated. Um, as this student here was measuring some of the crops in this growing environment. And sometimes we're looking at these teachers over here on the far right panel. We're talking about a greater density of solar. In case you wanna concentrate your solar into you know, a, one portion of your parcel of land and grow under that, um, but not grow over, grow under the entire panel array. In this example, the panel um, density is much greater per unit area than on the left. And so pointing out that this can look like a lot of different um, things. And sometimes we're talking about agrivoltaics, that agriculture not being crop production, but being forage production for sheep for grazing. Sometimes that ag is coming in the form of uh, creating an apiary so that we can have pollinator habitat and you know, honeybee activities. And this co-location of vegetation and renewable energy yields all kinds of benefits. On the right is the scene that many of you are familiar with, food production. Growing crops in rows, irrigating in some way or directing the water in some ways that you can support that plant growth. And that gives us food production. On the opposite end of the spectrum is energy production. And in the Western US, a lot of times that means clearing the vegetation out. And so you make a trade-off. You can produce energy in that system, but you don't produce other things. What we're talking about is a co-location of these two so that you think about the width of these little legs here on each of these things, representing how much you get from that system. You can actually get more energy in an agrivoltaic system um, if you can increase the efficiency of these panels in ways we can talk about later. You can also think about ways of other things you get, like water conservation. Each of these gives you revenue, but what is that potential for revenue gain when you have these two co-located together? And those of you who do farming or do energy production know that it's not just food or just energy. There's a whole suite of benefits. And in ecology, we call these ecosystem services, those things that you, you get either tangible or intangible from a system. And so in what we call flower diagrams, you see these little stems and these petals uh, represent how much of certain things you might get. In a food production system, unless you're talking about biofuels, you're not getting energy production but you are getting crop production, whether or not that's for food or anim, uh, food for animals or humans. You're getting biomass that's doing carbon uptake from the atmosphere. So that's a great service, that, that scrubbing of the atmosphere. In terms of thinking about um, conservation cropping, you're doing a lot of carbon sequestration, like capturing that carbon, it goes into supplying that plant, helping it do all that, that good work of making food for us, but it's also storing some in the soil. And just acknowledging that in these different land use decisions, whether you're going wholesale from one to the other, you're making trade-offs. And what we want to do is remind us that, that there are trade-offs in terms of each of these decisions of land use. And think about the ways that we might see augmented or even boosted levels of services from the co-location of these systems. You know, if we can find ways that growing forage grasses or crops in the shade of a solar panel increases their production, then you can extend this crop production flower in an agrivoltaic system, increase the amount of biomass, increase the carbon sequestration. So how does that work? 
Well, in this graphic, we're just illustrating on the left in panel A, solar with forage grasses underneath, and on panel B, panels with crop production underneath. And what we're trying to do is create what we call in ecology novel ecosystems, things that we've created, putting them together. And we're trying to do things like adapt our food systems to survive through periods of drought and temperature stress, thinking about the things that, that a changing climate that we've been experiencing the last few years especially are doing to our plants. Sometimes that's creating temperatures that are just too hot because we're getting those heat waves we didn't used to, or too cold at the wrong time of year, um, too dry because suddenly the rains we used to count on aren't coming. Being in the shade of a solar panel really kind of dampens all of those different environmental stressors. The energy folks are interested in this more and more because we're able to improve the renewable energy production. And the reason I'm saying this is on this graphic here, on the y-axis, the one going up and down, we're talking about the efficiency of a solar panel. And on the x-axis, temperature. And in case you're not used to thinking about Celsius, the beginning of this graph is about 25 Celsius, which is about 77 degrees Fahrenheit. And so what this is showing is that for the most part, solar panels decrease in their efficiency linearly with temperature. That means as it gets too hot, they're actually underperforming too. So what we're hoping to do is utilize that cooling effect that comes from plants. Those of you who've walked around farms, have you felt it. It's just cooler than it is in a parking lot because of all that transpirational cooling that comes off the crops. Well, these blue arrows represent the fact we're using that transpiration to actually cool down the solar panel and try to help it become more efficient. And the final one is in terms of water. You know, just think about any place practically, if you spill your water in the summertime in the shade versus the sun, where does it stay wet longer? If in the shadier environment we can howl, have each irrigation event last longer in the soil to do that work of supporting plants, that means we're gonna to have to use less water. And that's especially important as we move into drier climate zones or places that experience increased dryness. And a lot of this was summarized in a paper we put together um, and that can be found on what Stacy will talk about later, this, this clearinghouse resource, if you wanna get into the nerdy science of it. So I just wanted to put in a couple of questions we get almost every time we talk about this with farmers. Can, handles, can plants handle being grown in the shade? And thankfully I do this kind of science and so I had some good answers to this. So in this example, the Y axis is a measure of photosynthesis, that ability of the plant to function. You might say, why are we measuring photosynthesis? I just wanna know if it makes, makes as many sweet potatoes. Well, photosynthesis is just like when you go to the doctor and they take your pulse and your blood pressure to see how you're doing. We can measure the plant's photosynthesis rate and see how it's doing. And because people have measured photosynthesis across a lot of different light levels, for this tomato plant, for example, you can see that plants do, um, they do need more sunlight as we go um, in increasing sunlight levels. But so your, your biology teacher told you the right thing. Plants do need sunlight, but look how quickly they plateau in their function. That's important because this sunlight uh, symbol represents where we are in terms of full sunlight. And this shadier sun represents this light level in the shade of a solar array. And so you can see that, yes, you do take a hit in terms of that photosynthetic rates because we're not way up here, we're depressed somewhat. But because of this curvilinear relationship between photosynthesis and light, it doesn't mean that a 75% reduction in light means a 75% reduction in your production. And it's important because we're actually thinking about those trade-offs, remember? Here's a plot of the photosynthesis of a plant in response to temperature. Plants are like us. They don't love it too cold. They don't love it too hot. They like it somewhere in between. And in some environments in the summer, we end up beyond that optimal point. Whereas in the shade, we all know it's cooler. And so you can be closer to that optimal point. So we do take this trade-off approach, a small reduction in your capacity because you're in lower light, but an increased capacity because of your temperature situation. And clearly you have to understand the agronomy or the plant function in, in your environment and with your crops to know how well this is gonna work. Well, here's an example of some of the work we were doing. And it's important to know, um, and farmers may have realized this, 
But if we're looking at a plot of photosynthesis throughout a day, plants are green all day, right? They don't change colors throughout the day, but that doesn't mean they're doing photosynthesis all day. In fact, in our plants out in the open sun, they turn on when the sun does. They do enormous amounts of photosynthesis that capturing carbon to grow and form fruits. But in the hotter time of the year, by lunchtime, they're shut off. You might see a little blip in that golden hour of sunlight at the end of the day, but they really concentrate their production to a shorter window. Otherwise, it just is too hot or too dry. And that's why sometimes farmers in drier or warmer places have to irrigate a second time to kind of keep plants from wilting. But remember that the fact that we can keep that, that temperature and drought stress reduced in an agrivoltaic system under a solar array, here's that hit we were talking about. Under optimal conditions, in terms of temperature and moisture, a little bit less light means a little bit less carbon uptake, but they can stay active longer during the day. It's a classic you know, turtle, tortoise, and the hare situation. So beyond thinking about carbon rates, we can go back to food production, fruit production, and we can see that for some of our crops, like peppers and tomatoes especially, under the agrivoltaic setting, we can get enormously greater production. For some crops like jalapeno, we saw like about an 8% de decrease. And so this I show oftentimes to make sure everybody knows there's not a one size fit all solution. Some crops really love it. Some crops don't like it. Some crops don't really mind. This, these two on the end suggest a situation where adding photovoltaics would actually boost production. Jalapenos means that you can do both and capture that income from energy and that income from leasing for production and leaf. At this point, as Lisa noted, we've been doing this work for a while and we've been able to build out a table of crops where we've seen positive benefits or incredibly positive benefits as in the example of carrots I'll talk about next. So another way that agrivoltaics helps, particularly in some of these environments, um, such as Indiana and Colorado, is helping us extend the growing season. And farmers, I know this, on, on clear nights, we cool off a lot more than we do on cloudy nights. And that's because all that energy that we got during the day returns back to the atmosphere, like these wavy arrows are representing. But clouds trap that and keep us warmer, kind of like an atmospheric blanket. Well, actually, solar panels do something very similar um, to the crop area underneath them. And so part of the way that we've been doing uh, this work is using that trapped heat and that microclimate that it creates to actually um, to our advantage. And here's an example of a project we did with a local high school at an agrivoltaic site. Here, they wanted to grow carrots. They understood from our measurements that you're actually changing the, the microclimate in that area under a solar panel versus out in the open. And they said, okay, if it's, if it's cooler in there in like August than it is out in the full sun in the open condition, does that mean we can plant crops that would come in cooler parts of the year now? And so we did that study. Way down here, we plant carrots in um, November, late, late October, early November. But the students are growing crops in late August. And you can see those seeds that they planted when it wasn't the right season just died for science. Whereas in this agrivoltaic setting, we actually had changed the microclimate enough we could create opportunities for germination. And what that meant was that these crops came online way earlier than they did typically. And this is the work we did with this teacher here, such that by November, when the carrots were coming up well, it was harvest time over here. And that meant that these guys got three harvests of carrots instead of the one that they're used to, because it also extended the growing season on the other end. So another way of tr using that trapped heat to our advantage is thinking about those random frosts or those random hailstorms that we get that really mess us up. The crops under these solar panels are protected from both those random frosts and the hail damage. In this example, we are growing sweet potatoes here in the agrivoltaic setting and here in that open sun setting. And this is after some frost we had in December. Here's a very disappointed first grader looking at some of the sweet potato plants and how they got that frost damage and now they're done for the season. Whereas under this agrivoltaic setting, they're still growing. 
And it's turned out in here that we can grow, <clears throat> that we can maintain production outside of our traditional growing season. And so what does that mean when you're operating in this type of environment and suddenly you're the one that can produce sweet potatoes, basil, carrots, these other crops out of season and how that might boost your opportunity um, for selling. Ultimately, you can see this basil plant in our agrivoltaic setting that ended up being six feet tall because it didn't experience frost damage. Another thing that I wanted to share about is how the leaves of some of these plants have changed. This is an example of basil. On the right is a typical basil leaf that we grew in our full sun setting. Whereas the basil leaf on your left here is grown in the agrivoltaic setting. And you can see how that leaf actually grew to a larger size to capture sunlight. And that's helpful if you are a farmer who's selling crops per unit leaf area or per bushel, because you're obviously gonna have a lot more production with these larger leaves. And we found some similar features happening in our lettuces. So before we get into Byron, who's gonna show you more about this site, I wanna show you a drone image of this research site up in Colorado to help you see that we really are talking about marrying crop production in line with solar. You can see how we're growing three rows of crops between each one of these um, rows of solar panels. But we're doing so in a way that we can try to account for what that shading means at different times of day, what those water requirements are, so we can capture a better um, a better understanding more globally, literally across the globe, about what's the potential for agrivel tanks. So I want to maybe I'll end here uh, for sake of time with this graphic. This is showing us um, these little pumpkin symbols uh, from this graphic from the National Renewable Energy Lab. It's showing all the different places we're doing agrivel research related to crop production, and the green uh, flowery symbol is other places where we're measuring other ecosystem services related to pollinator habitat or forage production. I want to add that you might have noticed there's a pretty big gap in the Indiana region, but thanks to a recent USDA grant, we now are going to be building out a site um, in, in Urbana-Champaign, and so there will be another climate zone represented through that research. You do have one question if you'd like to take it right now. Sure, yes, I, well, I thought I saw Actually, it. I guess you've got a couple of questions. Um, very interesting ideas. Have you done an economic analysis on this yet? Great, so that is actually a big part of this USDA grant, is now that we've understand uh, somewhat from the physical science capacity of what kind of crops are doing, what kind of level of production in these systems, is what does it mean to be able to sell outside of the growing season? What does it mean to elevate your solar um, system so that you can allow for this production? How does this impact the type of equipment that can be used? These are all part of the, the broader collection of understanding that we're working on now. And the question around cultivation and harvest equipment, um, that is clearly, going to be a big driver up front. We talk about needing to understand all the levers and knobs that we have to turn and, and twist to, to design a system to do both types of production. Um, in Byron's site, you'll be able to see how he was able to move a tractor through this system. Um, and in our system, to get to this next question, our solar panels on our low end in Arizona are 10 feet off the ground. And that's because the farmers here said, I still want to be able to drive my Ford tractor through there, and most of the tractors have, need a 10-foot clearance. When you start to get into more specialty equipment, that has to come right from the beginning in terms of uh, determining your row spacing and everything. But better, I'll pause for there and uh, see what kind of questions we accumulate with Byron. Thank you. Byron, and it looks like we've got some other great questions coming in and uh, we'll, we'll be addressing those shortly. Yep, sounds good. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Lisa. Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Byron Kamenek. I'm the developer, owner, and manager of Jack Solar Garden. I, I know at the beginning, Lisa mentioned that I was a farmer and can't say I'm going to take that title. 
Uh, I'm a farm manager. My, my mom owns the land here and uh, I've been out here for about five years managing the land. But my understanding of what a farmer is, is you have to earn your full living off of the land for a minimum of 10 years before you get that title. So I'm, I'm, I'm just a land manager here. Um, but uh, let's see, is that going to work? There we go. Um, what I'm going to do is walk you all through uh, what we have going on here at my family's farm. Um, we have 24 acres of land, three different pastures, um, two that are eight acres a piece, and one is six acres. And we've mainly been a, a hay producing farm for a long time. Uh, my grandfather, Jack Stingery, uh, uh, pictured here, he's the, he's the fellow that uh, purchased our family's land back in 1972. Uh, my mother there, pictured as the little girl on a tractor, she grew up on my granddad's farm down in Westminster, Colorado, about 120 plus acres, where I remember she was telling me she used to ride her horse to school, tie it up outside, and then come home in the evenings. And they had uh, a farm that had uh, all, all sorts of things, from pigs, chickens, to wheat fields, alfalfa, uh, they had cattle, a whole range of things like what a, uh, what a normal small holder farm would have back in those days. And even these days, it's just a diversified plot of land. So when I moved out to this land in 2016 to learn more about what we could do with it, I, you know, you, you got to keep in mind that diversified aspect, just going all in on one thing uh, can make it hard. So what we did was we took this eight acre hay field that used to produce upwards of 500 bales of hay a year and uh, for uh, folks that don't know I we would sell a hay or small bale hay that's uh, 60 pounds for about eight dollars upwards nine dollars a bale um, and that, that just barely paid for our property tax plus water rights and utilities if you account for the whole farm so not enough to go to the grocery store on and what we decided is to work with Boulder County on figuring out what it would be like to uh, put a solar array on our land. So after a, a year plus of working with them to change their land use code so that we could, uh, we built a 1.2 megawatt community solar garden. And when I say community solar garden, that is strictly a, a legal legislative term. In 2010, Colorado legislator, le legislature uh, created this term. Uh, so that folks could create a, sol a community group could create a solar array together and then sell the electricity among themselves and then have a local utility be able to partner with them on that. And so I, I didn't create that term community solar garden. It's, it's part of law and all that. But what we did was take the idea of uh, Jack solar garden of my grandfather's name and, and mix in the rest of it. And I'll be able to talk to you more about all the different little components of how we've integrated the community and the garden aspect into our solar array. And I'll point out that uh, our panels are single axis tracking and they could power up to about 300 homes in our area. And what we created was um, about four acres of solar panels. And here you can see how uh, uh, these are drone images from Namaste Solar, where they, they clearly show the areas that we've tilled underneath the solar panels and then areas that are in research. So those green areas underneath the solar panels are, are spots where researchers from uh, Colorado State University are looking at carbon sequestration underneath the panels or water movement, uh, soil moisture. And a little bit further south or further east on that uh, picture, uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory is also looking at pasture grasses as well as wildflower growth underneath our panels. Uh, but these, these static pictures, I don't really think tell the whole story. So what I did was create a, uh, a time-lapse video over the course of a week in September. So that was a Sunday, now we're on a Monday, going on to Tuesday next, uh, where you can see that the panels are turning east to west every day. The solar panels are elevated to heights of about six feet on two thirds of the solar array and up to eight feet on, um, on the other third of the solar array. Now here at the end of the week, you're gonna see a whole lot of vehicles come out onto the land. And this is when we had a big party at the, on September 25th and had about a hundred plus people out there. And you can see the lights on uh, in that section of the solar array where we had a shindig about, uh, yeah, hundred plus folks came out and uh, 
I had a bluegrass band play. That was a good time. Uh, so that leads me to what, what we wanted to do with our space. Uh, being a community solar garden, we really wanted to stress the community side of things, being able to bring folks out to our, our solar array, get people better educated about uh, what it's like of being able to operate within a solar array um, and uh, be able to learn, learn more about what it's like to grow different types of vegetation from crops to grasses to perennials. So I'll talk on the on the research side, as I mentioned, we're partnering with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, Colorado State University and University of Arizona to learn more about uh, the carbon sequestration underneath the solar panels to wildflower seed mixes that work within our, our solar array to uh, water management and biomass collection of, of different pasture grasses to better understanding the soil moisture, uh, soil heat flux, uh, temperature, humidity, light intensity underneath the solar panels. And, uh, that bottom right hand picture is a, a, a research assistant of, of Greg's uh, that was out here collecting information. Um, move on. We also had about um, uh, just around an acre of land that was in crop production. We partnered with a nonprofit organization called Sprout City Farms that are farmers uh, that uh, they, they cultivated over 8,600 pounds of produce on just, uh, yeah, just about an acre of land between uh, July 1st and October 15th of this past year. We built the solar array in 2020, had it operationalized uh, November of 2020 and out here in Colorado, that's, that's when our, our land goes dormant. And then uh, 2021 was our very first season of growing anything. So we had to go out, create the, the bed rows that uh, Greg showed you from a uh, overview picture. Um, of our solar array where we had three different bed rows and growing a, a wide variety of different crops in here. Uh, here's a, a little video that uh, a partner of Greg's made of our solar array being able to show you. This is in our uh, about six foot where those torque tubes are about six feet high. And we have tomatoes growing in the middle, uh, eggplant growing on this side uh, closest to us now. Uh, we had about 30 different types of crops growing out there from beets, turnips, peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, uh, lettuces, uh, arugula, uh, kohlrabi, all sorts of things. It was the first time I ever had kohlrabi. I loved it. Uh, and here's a, a little section of zinnias and, and beans. So there, there you can easily see the distinction between the three different bed rows that we were talking about. And each different bed gets a, a different uh, time of day of sun. As Greg was mentioning that uh, different plants or that, that plants can only handle so much sunlight before their photosynthesis rate starts, uh, uh, I guess, plateauing. And so as the panels turn over the course of the day, the, um, uh, the light moves. And here's a time lapse of just one day so you can get a chance to see that. So this is first thing in the morning, uh, and you can see as the as it gets to midday, then all of the beds are going to get uh, just about full sun, and then in the afternoon when the panels tilt fully to the west, you can see which uh, which beds get shade first, and so those would be areas where crops maybe don't want it as hot, um, and then you can see that eastern bed gets that full afternoon sun. So crops that can handle uh, heat a little bit better would do well there. You also saw that there was a bunch of people that were scattering through that uh, aisle really quickly. And I'll just play that, well, play that. Shoot, maybe I'll play it again. There we go. I'll just play it again so you can see how when they're out here in the morning that they're working in the shade. And so this is uh, an opportunity for farm labor to work during those morning hours in the shade. And if they can, they can take a break in the midday for a couple hours while sun is everywhere. And then in the later afternoon when the uh, when it's still really hot outside and the panels are tilted fully west, that the farm labor could also still work in the shade, all just kind of depending on um, what the flow on the farm is. I'll also point out here how the panels are fully tilted to the west when we were creating those beds. Uh, I was driving my tractor up and down the aisles, uh, ripping and then tilling the pan tilling the uh, those uh, crop bed rows, and I could do it 
depending on the time of day. I didn't stop my solar array from turning. I didn't tilt all the panels in one direction and then take two whole days to go through there and rip and then till the land. I just did it in coordination with how the panels were tilted. So when the panels were fully tilted to the west, I could drive my tractor on the east side of the panels. When the panels were fully tilted to the east, I could drive on the west side of the panels. And I'd get my tractor tire within inches of those piles as I would go. And uh, because we worked with our, our, the actual installer of the solar array, Namaste Solar, uh, they didn't put wires underneath the ground um, uh, close, to the, close to the surface of the ground anywhere in the solar array site. Uh, they bury the wires about three foot deep. And then, uh, so I, I mean, there was no way that I was gonna be ripping down three feet. So it was uh, nice and easy to be able to do that. And it worked well in conjunction with uh, the solar array. Point out here that uh, we also had a, a, a pollinator habitat that was built around the solar array. I say built because it was about an acre of land. Uh, Audubon Rockies paid for and helped install uh, over 3,000 perennials from uh, elderberries, raspberries, blackberries, gooseberries, uh, hazelnuts to sand cherries, nanking cherries, uh, different types of currants, coral berries plum trees, apple trees, cherry trees, all the way around it. Uh, and that became our vegetative barrier to the outside world. So it's a means for creating a, a space for beneficial insects and, uh, and birds. And, and what I love is that uh, we had a lot of snakes in that area. Typically on our hay fields, our, our cutters would go through and unfortunately we would kill off a bunch of the garter or bull snakes that were in the, in the area that weren't underground at the time. But having this strip of land around the outside, we noticed some beautiful six and seven foot long bull snakes that were uh, helping us out with our rabbit population. So just having that barrier around the perimeter of the solar array was quite nice to see. Plus with all the, the fruiting, raspberries and blackberries, when we did educational tours for folks, people could stop by and, and pick those berries as we continued around the solar array. We've hosted a, a variety of events on our land from uh, opening ceremonies through having that uh, farm to table dinner on September 25th of this past year. And we intend to do more events out here in the future. I think we had uh, in total over a thousand people come out for either tours or events on our land this past year. And we hope to about double that in the coming year. But in that top middle picture where you see that tractor and those folks um, uh, looking at looking at uh, uh, what NREL has there and, and talking to each other, that's in our eight foot section. So you can see how easy it is for people to just walk out underneath the eight foot side. When the panels are flat like that, I could even drive my F-150 underneath those panels without touching the torque tube. We also promote artists out here. Um, we have uh, an annual stipend that we provide to a, a local artist to figure out what to do on our land to incorporate community members into it. So during our first year, we, um, uh, we gave the stipend to a local permaculturalist that repurposed some of our farm materials into artwork that you can see on the left-hand side there. And then uh, this past year, we had a, a never thought that this was gonna happen, but we, we found an artist that was a dancer. And so she did dance film, did some dance education for uh, young kids that you can see in that top right corner, and then filmed a bunch of professional dancers. And that bottom right-hand side was when we had an event out here in October that uh, we showcased those films for, for a crowd of folks. And down in the middle picture, uh, we had a, a banjo player come out once during the season. And, uh, we look forward to having more music events out here in the coming years and probably do that as fundraisers for our nonprofit, the Colorado Agrivoltaic Learning Center. And that leads us to uh, talking about youth. So uh, the Colorado Agrivoltaic Learning Center in coordination with Jack Solar Garden has brought out a, a variety of folks over the, over the course of the past year. So I said about a thousand people came out for tours or events and we had over 150 high school students that came out to learn more about uh, what it was like to integrate agriculture inside of a solar array. And uh, that bottom right hand picture again was from Colorado State University where they were collecting biomass. And so all of this is to have is our, I guess my, my family's efforts to create something that's more beneficial to our community. 
it increased our revenue so that now I can go to the grocery store and that we're able to handle all of our um, all of the farm's uh, expenses from the energy being produced here. And then we also still have a, uh, at least one field that's in hay production. So we still handle that side. So that's been a, a huge help. Um, and then over time, we're still learning what it's like from our researchers as to what we can do out here on the land. And we'll be continuing to evolve what we're doing. And we hope to continue incorporating uh, community members into it over time. And to do this, we, we work with uh, the Colorado Agrivoltaic Learning Center to help attain three goals of teaching, teaching young people about uh, land stewardship within solar arrays, because we don't want to see more solar arrays being built where the land underneath of it is just compacted down to dirt um, and that the, the land is taken out of productivity. We can show folks, we can show kids that it's still possible to be good land stewards, even within a solar array where the primary function may not be agriculture. It can be solar with the secondary of agriculture or vice versa. Two, we wanna be able to show community members what it's like to be out here within a solar array because most folks may love solar, but they've never actually been within a solar array. So it's great to be able to bring people out, have them walk underneath the panels, be a little bit more familiar with it. Just like folks are interested in having local food, we can show them local power production. And then finally, we also are, are working with policymakers to be able to show those folks what it's like of, of um, having this coordination, of having that uh, co-location of agriculture with solar. And that bottom picture there on the right-hand side is from uh, Colorado Governor uh, Jared Polis that came out here this past summer to sign legislation pertaining to soil health. And part of that, um, uh, part of that bill had about $150,000 going towards uh, the research and studying agrivoltaics here in Colorado. And my understanding is that there's policymakers still continuing to work on additional legislation that would help support and encourage agrivoltaics moving forward here in Colorado. So those are conversations we hope to be able to help help along, especially as uh, uh, we're, we're one of the largest uh, agrivoltaic systems in the country that's doing so much on our land. And I mean, I, I'd say we're probably the coolest one out there. Sorry, Greg. Um, well, I, I guess part because of Greg we are. Uh, <laughs> I also like to point out that we have uh, a world of partnerships we had the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, CSU and University of Arizona that's out here doing the research. Sprout City Farms is doing the farming underneath the panels. Audubon Rockies helped us out with pollen air habitat around the outside of it. Colorado Agrivoltaic Learning Center takes on the tours and the events out here on our land. But we couldn't do this without folks that were actually funding us uh, by purchasing our electricity. And, and there we have uh, two governments of Boulder County and the city of Boulder that purchased into our solar array to help us build this, build the system to begin with. And then five companies that have subscribed in. And uh, the, I'll point out the top two in the flow, Cannabis and Terrapin Care Station are, are two cannabis companies here in Colorado that the city of Boulder and Boulder County tax at a higher rate for the energy that they consume. They can either pay the government an additional two plus cents per kilowatt hour for the energy that they consume uh, uh, for growing cannabis, or they can subscribe into a community solar garden. And so those companies saw the benefit of uh, helping support our business here of, of producing electricity for our community. And I'll also mention that um, we, we do have a consultancy here on the land, Jack Solar Garden Developments, to be able to help support others that have specific projects that want to uh, have better advice and guidance for what they can grow, how to work with governments, and how to uh, work with communities to make something more out of their land than just producing uh, uh, solar power. All right, I think that's about all I got. So thanks, folks. Yeah, By Byron, I want to ask a question that actually came in when Greg was speaking, but he thought that you would be the one to speak to it. Um, and that is, how much did the cost increase to raise the panels 10 feet off the ground? Sure, uh, and it wasn't 10 foot. So we, the standard height for a single axis tracking system in Colorado, the torque tube is about four feet high. You bump it up to six feet, and now you have two additional feet of steel out of the ground and two, uh, two additional feet of steel in the ground. And what we were seeing on uh, putting that in on two thirds of our property, that increased our overall project cost by about 1%. Uh, 
And then we, when we were doing the installation for the eight foot side, so now instead of having uh, just two feet extra out of the ground, you had four feet extra of steel out of the ground and four feet extra steel in the ground. So there's a 2% increase. And then uh, adding on that the panels are up higher, it takes more uh, people hours to, to put up the panel. So they had to bring out ladders and had multiple people putting in one panel versus on the six foot side where one person could uh, set it up uh, much faster. So just uh, additional hours. So we were seeing that the, the total cost of elevating the panels up was somewhere between four and 5%. And what do those numbers look like in other parts of the country, in the Midwest or in the Northeast, um, the, the typical number of feet off the ground for the solar panels? Does that vary? It varies mainly because of snow. I think in uh, Minnesota and some other climbs that get uh, uh, snow over two feet, then uh, the panels are going to go up higher. And then in the far south where you're not going to get any snow, then you can be inches off the ground. I was going to say it does vary widely. Um, and as Byron noted for those very, uh, those very real climatic reasons, some others have done some work on, you know, making sure it doesn't need to be different equipment for that installation, which obviously could increase the cost too. The other part is Byron is elevating at six feet and eight feet for research purposes. When I mentioned the 10 feet, that's how high ours was down in Arizona because we went with more of like just a large ramada or a large canopy over solar when we first did that trial. Byron represents the, the next generation of how this would actually be deployed in terms of you know, the single axis tracking happening on these piles that were in rows, just like crops are in rows. And in that case, they don't need to be 10 feet off the ground unless that's prescribed by the equipment, the combines that some of these questions we're asking about. You know, we're finding are growing a, quite a bit, growing well under the six foot. And so part of the research that'll come out of Byron's place uniquely is, you know, that extra 1% in steel and that extra percents that came from labor, is it worth it? Or is six feet good enough? The other part, when someone asked about that combine part, I want to get at Byron is, you know, you're dragging a tiller through there, but your tractor is, you know, not as wide. And tractors also have a wider wheelbase, and that can fit under those panels. As Byron said, he was able to drive alongside the piles of that torque tube that tracks. Um, you didn't have to, you didn't have to have the entire width of space between those rows, the width of your tractor. You just had to be where your wheels weren't running into the panels. That makes sense. Byron, you got Great, to... Byron. I'm gonna jump in here on the width. Um, we did have a question on how do solar panels fit with traditional size of tractors and combines? And I think what Don is asking is a little bit on the, you know, if I think about a 12 row corn planter there, you're talking about a 32 foot width or, um, 16 row might be more like a 42 foot width. How, how would that play into it? You know, you, you can design the solar array how you like. It's a man-made thing. So if you want to build it 400 feet high or two inches off the ground, you know, it all depends on how much money you have to put towards it. Or if you want to have spacing in between the rows be 30 plus feet, you know, that, that's on you. Um, so the, the solar array can be designed for the purposes of agriculture as best as you like, but then you're also going to be giving up the potential production for electricity. So there's a um, cost benefit to it. And if the landowner is going to be owning the solar array in the long term, then it's, uh, then it's easier to make those modifications. But if the landowner doesn't want to own the system and is just leasing out their land for somebody else to build the solar array on, those developers are going to want to maximize the electricity production. So they're going to pile in those panels as close as they can. Now, Jack Solar Garden was built in, in terms of producing as much electricity as we can. So we did not increase the, the width of those uh, of, the, of our rows. The only thing that we changed was the height of our panels. Byron, can you speak to any benefits in northern climates? Specifically, the question uh, relates to the Northeast US. Um, statement says most of the benefit seems to be in climates that are water short. How do you answer that? 
I think uh, Greg's research and other folks have been showing that agrivoltaics would work best in places where it's a lot of sun and it's also drier climates because then you have that water conservation tactic. Whereas like out, out east, um, you know, it all depends on your solar array um, solar array design. But one thing I think about is the potential for uh, trapping in that heat, trapping in humidity in an area that I, I love the idea of growing mushrooms underneath some of those solar panels out on the East Coast. But I, I'm sure Greg would have something to say on that. Yeah, I think the other thing I would add to it is, I mean, think about the Northeast. They have the same issue as they have in, uh, in places like Japan. Uh, I know Japan and the Northeast may seem very different, but they're analogous in that both of the places, all the land is being used already. And if we're starting to have these requirements towards a move towards more renewable energy, which a lot of people want, that energy has to go somewhere. You don't want to have the energy all in some way far off place because there's costs that come with that transport of energy back to where it's needed, the city center. So it, it doesn't end up on rooftops because there's not enough rooftops to supply all of the need. And so that energy production is going to come, it's being demanded, and it's gonna end up in that peri-urban area, the area around the cities where the farms currently are. And so in the Northeast in Massachusetts, some of our partners are starting from the opposite end. They're not putting in a full dense array of solar panels. They're starting off with how much solar can I bring into this farm and not have negative impacts? So the benefit is simply keeping agriculture alive in that region, being able to continue to have that agrarian community or that agrarian mindset, but also produce energy. And what that means is an additional revenue source because so many of our farms aren't making large volumes of money. This is an additional revenue source acknowledging that this land use change is on the horizon. And so it's just being really intentional about not doing damage, as Byron is saying, like not putting in solar and not being mindful of what's underneath. But I know we still have uh, Stacy to get to, so we better pause and I see some people are dropping off. Okay, I was gonna okay. Um, hit one more question, if you don't mind, before we get to Stacy. it's kind of a two-parter. Um, Byron, since the panels are tilting, is the tilt tracking being optimized? And if so, um, presumably for electricity production rather than agronomic benefits? Correct. It's being optimized for electricity production. And was it your preference or Namaste Solars to go with tracking arrays versus fixed tilt arrays? And this presumes that tracking arrays cost more. It was my preference. Uh, over the long term, more power is being produced from a single axis tracking system than a south facing fixed. Okay, thank you. Um, we will try to get to as many of these as we can when um, Stacy's finished with her presentation and take it away, Stacy. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Um, thank you to Lisa and to CCSI. And thanks, Greg and Byron. Those were really interesting. Um, I'll just be very brief. Um, I wanted to let everybody know about a new resource. It's the AgriSolar Clearinghouse. This is an information sharing relationship building clearinghouse of information that is sponsored by the Department of Energy by their Solar Energy Technology Office. The website is here, our email also, and the phone number if you'd like to get a hold of us. These are a few of the features of the clearinghouse. We have a centralized hub. If you go to our homepage, you can sign up and become part of our network. We'll send you newsletters, not too frequently, we won't spam you. Um, we also have a user forum you can join if you want to talk to folks online there. We have a chat throughout the website if you want technical assistance. We're there eight to five um, with our energy specialists and our ag specialists at NCAT. Some of the folks on the call might know NCAT from our ATRA program or our Soil for Water or our Arm to Farm and our energy program. So those folks are part of this. And we have a large partner group too. Greg is a part of that. I'll talk about them in a moment. And we have a peer-to-peer -peer networking. If anyone would like to join as a peer mentor or a peer mentee, we're facilitating that. We're developing a storytelling atlas of all of the different sites around the country. And then we have an information library I'll talk about just for a sec here. This is our media section. The media section contains blog posts 
and we curate news articles. Um, you know, when, when you see an article about, there's several about Jack Solar Garden there, uh, we curate those as they come up. So you can, you can get that information in one spot. We have videos from our partners and case studies, and we're developing a podcast series. And then we have a free to download image gallery. We have a library. Um, this library has over 300 peer reviewed uh, free to download articles. Um, I, I like the, the geeky science stuff like Greg was describing. So we have a lot of that there, a lot of Greg's studies. Um, and then we uh, have each of them abstracted if you wanna know what's going on. The whole site is by the way compliant. So it's accessible to all. And we'll be adding to that over time too. That was just to kick it off the original 300. This is our forum. Um, we're always open for more forum topics. If you want to join and let us know something else that we want to talk about within the forum. And one of the big strengths of the Agrisola Clearinghouse is our partner group. We have a wonderful partner and stakeholder group. Greg is one of our partners. We're also partners with folks at the national labs around the country, uh, the NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab, Oak Ridge, and Argonne. We have folks from the Smithsonian. Uh, uh, the Center for Rural Affairs, folks from Cal Poly, uh, George Washington University, and some renewable energy advocates around the country like Renewable Northwest and MREA, and then uh, folks like Ridge to Reefs, and they're doing really interesting research in insular communities, so in Hawaii and Puerto Rico, where there's a, a really nice um, marriage of need for land and farming, so and solar, so it, it works well for agrivoltaics. And we've got groups like Helical Solar and they're looking at cattle underneath. So you have to raise the racking system for that, but they're doing some good work in that space. And we've got case studies on those on the Agrisolar Clearinghouse. We also have a wonderful stakeholder group. Uh, I think I saw Lucy in one of the chats there. Lucy, uh, Lucy Stolzenberg is one of our stakeholders. Um, Andy Bingel from the Colorado Agrivoltaic Learning Center is also a stakeholder. We've got great uh, people like the ASGA group, American Solar Grazing Association is part of this. So is the BM Butterfly Habitat Fund, um, groups like NL and the Pollinator Partnership and American Farmland Trust. Um, so if any of you would like to meet any of these folks or would like to be connected, just let me know. We can do that as a function of our networking at the AgriSolar Clearinghouse. And then I'm open for any questions, but I'll, I, I know we're at the end of our time, so. I'll, I'll stop there. Um, listener joining from Illinois, where they're looking specifically at pairing solar panels with Midwest crops, such as soybeans, wheat, and corn. Corn height seems to be a deterrent for agrivoltaics. That being said, in terms of crop rotation, what grain crops other than corn could be paired with soybeans in the Midwest? I guess I'll jump in for starters. Um, that is one of the uh, aspects of the research that we're doing over in Urbana-Champaign. You know, obviously an additional corn soybean hub. Um, that part of the project there, we were talking about also investigating sorghum um, as something that grows across multiple regions that we would be testing there. So that is, um, that's a good place of where if this particular individual was reaching out to Stacy, we would hear from the community, you know, about what kinds of crops need to be considered. This is a five-year grant. Um, and so the hope is that, you know, we will use the science that we've been doing to drive that first year of questions, but because that's multiple years, that means multiple opportunities to conduct research on crops of interest. Corn and is another interesting one up there. Cotton is really uh, a big crop in a lot of regions. But as you said, there are features of that crop system that mean it's not compatible or not compatible as we do it right now. Um, you could certainly, as Byron noted, elevate the panels even more. And because places around the world are looking to elevate their crops even more to accommodate the really large combines there are people working on the racking systems that can be, you know, tens of feet in the air. That is very much on the horizon um, as a possibility. So sorry, no short answer, except sorghum is something we're going to also explore along with soybeans. Great, thanks for that. Um, sorry, my screen keeps jumping around on me. Um, 
Byron, how do you handle the transition from hay field to solar panels installed from a veg perspective? And did you keep the existing vegetation in place while construction was taking place then till after? Yeah, we kept it in place. So if you, if you went through and tilled up your land and created a whole bunch of dirt and then you had um, um, pile drivers drive over top of that, you're going to compact your soil even more. And if it rained, you're going to have a mess on your hands. So the whole point of it was to keep the vegetation in place to be able to handle the traffic that was out on the field at the time. And then once the panels were installed, go through and create those crop beds. We do have portions of the solar array where the hay is still in production. And this past year, we had a really wet spring and we would have had a, a one really nice cutting of hay from underneath our panels. And then I even had to go back out and mow it again thereafter and probably would have had a, a second reduced uh, cutting from that hay. And that was without any irrigation on our land, whereas we flood irrigate our other fields. Great, thank you. For anyone interested in this, um, how do they start? Are there any grants available that you, any of you are aware of? Oh, I wish. Well, uh, Stacey, you got it. Go for it. Yeah, there, there's REAP grants available um, through the USDA, um, the Rural Energy Efficiency Program, or I'm sorry, the, the REAP program for REAP for USDA. We can help with that. Um, we're pretty good at applying for those um, as we just historically have done it at NCAT through our energy program and through our ag program. So if folks are interested in the REAP, we can help with that. I, I got a question right there, in Stacey. Okay. <laughs> when I looked into REAP a few years back, I was, I was declined because we were selling our electricity into the grid. Uh, the REAP program, at least at that time, maybe things have changed in the past year and a half or so, uh, but the REAP program was only if you were gonna use all the electricity on site. Um, and so if things have changed and then you're able to sell all the electricity into the grid, yeah, that was, they, that would have been able to provide 250 to $500,000. Yeah. I, I believe that it's possible. I've talked with them about this specific issue and, and they've said mm. that there are reprints available. So I, I should have built two years later. Well, you could even gonna, build more. I was just going to add for, for those, um, the, all three of us were a part of a USDA Department of Energy joint meeting yesterday because, you know, finally at the at the national level, both sides of this co-production are recognizing the potential, um, you know, for being more efficient with our land use and more intentional with our land use. And so yesterday we had their ear. Um, and so whether whether Byron's understanding or Stacy's understanding is right, I know that the guy in charge of that was um, hearing about this yesterday. And so they are more awoken to this potential and this need than when Byron applied. Great, can any of you speak to the rental rate that the solar companies are paying? I'll take that one. <laughs> so when, uh, when we were starting this project back in 2017, I, I didn't imagine owning the system um, nor operating in the future. I was just like, well, let's just lease the land to somebody and see what happens. So I, I contacted a handful of solar developers and we were being offered uh, $600 an acre a year. I said, well, eh, that's too little. I don't wanna bother with you all on that one. I mean, we, we get close to that on our, on our hay. So meh, let's, let's just leave that alone. And they came back the next week and offered twelve hundred dollars an acre a year. I said, "Ah, so there's money here. Let me let me sort out how to do this myself." So I, I was also reading in uh, about a large project that's being built somewhere in the mid Midwest by Doral Renewable, and in that uh, uh, in that news article, they were mentioning lease rates of six hundred to a thousand dollars per acre per year um, in some areas. And I'll say your, your ability to get higher lease rates is going to depend on how close you are to a, a three-phase electrical line. So our, that, that, the reason for that is how long do they have to pay for an electrical line to go from your farm over to the, the solar or to the electricity grid? Ours was about 200 feet, so it made it real cheap compared to folks that want to go a couple miles. So uh, if you notice that you have 
three phase lines nearby, then you're going to be in good shape. Great. Thank you, Byron. Another question for you, a great demonstration project. Could you please explain how the business model behind the community, what the business model behind the community solar overlay looks like? And does Jack Solar Garden receive a share of energy revenues, lease income, or both? Mm. So the community solar garden model is basically you pay upfront for a utility uh, utility power plant, just like a coal power plant, natural gas. You put a huge investment upfront, and then you recoup those costs over time. And then uh, for the you're looking at the lifetime of the project. So we have a 20 year long deal with Excel Energy, and we hope to be able to pay off our bank loan somewhere between your your 10 and 15, kind of depending on how much power we're able to produce or what, what different uh, incentives might come through on the, the Colorado State Legislature. But what we do is uh, there's something called power purchase agreements that you set up with either the local utility to buy your renewable energy credits or to buy your electricity straight. And then also subscription agreements that you can have with individual companies or residents or governments to be able to sell that power to them. Uh, each utility is gonna have different um, different means by how you can structure those agreements and also who your customers could be to be able to sell that electricity back to them or by what means if you have to create your own transmission lines which would be terrible or if you could just connect into that local utility grid thanks we have a question here from a solar developer interested in learning about crops that can be integrated with standard sat designs a 5% cost increase on the installation would be 15 to 30,000 per acre. How can they recoup that via ag production? I would say, um, I, I'm not quite sure on that math, um, but what I'll say on getting a, a landowner farmer involved in the land, my, my inclinations are from vegetable growing, you're probably not gonna be recouping those costs uh, off of just growing veggies. I, I don't want solar developers to think, well, okay, great. I'll, I'll just open up this land to farmers, landowners, and then they'll pay me rent for having this land. Probably ain't gonna happen, friend. Uh, more than likely, you're gonna need to provide some upfront capital or uh, some sort of salary for doing vegetation management. Most solar array assets owners have to pay some level of vegetative management practices over the course of the year. In some areas where it's wetter, they have to go out and mow that grass five, six times a season. Otherwise, the grass will grow up over top of the solar panels, depending on the height of them. But being able to take that money and instead putting it to a farmer to kickstart, being able to do an agrivoltaic system where they can come out and start, they, they know they'll have some level of money to be able to uh, survive on, and then they can spend their time to create a system in which they could continue uh, growing vegetables over time or whatever other types of crops they want to do. Um, I, I'm hesitant to say that there's that folks wouldn't be able to have a livelihood off of growing vegetables. I mean, it just depends on how good you are at doing it and what, what part of the country you're in, but also um, what types of specialty crops you decide to go with. We're also experimenting with some different herbs and botanicals that might have higher values uh, that a farmer might be able to uh, actually, after a time, be able to provide a rent back to the solar developer. But um, the, all that is very much so in, in the nascent learning stages. I don't know, Greg, you have anything you want to tack on that? I just add that you talked about the vegetation management, the opportunity for grazing um, leases and sheep production. Goats are terrible, but sheep are good. Um, someone also mentioned about cattle. That is definitely another area that's being explored. The Both the Department of Energy and the USDA recognize that they're are lots of opportunities for pasture land if we can get around the fact that cows are big, heavy, sometimes clumsy animals that like to scratch their backs on things. Um, but there, that means that we need to figure that out, which humans are great at solving problems. And so there are people actively working on the next generation of installation techniques that can um, work with that. 
I'd also like to add that, you know, from a solar developer perspective, this really increases community acceptance. So that might not be a dollar value that you're seeing coming in from a crop, but it's worth a lot of money. You know, it, it's worth a lot of time and effort and your staff time. And overall, you're going to have a happier community and, and much greater acceptance in the long term if, if you go this route. Fully agree with Stacy on that one. Like it, it, it'll open up lands that government wouldn't have allowed you to put in or, or I mean, if we were just putting up a solar array and not doing the rest of this, may, maybe our county and our community wouldn't have allowed us to do it. Right, yeah, it's gonna help you in your permitting. It's gonna help you in all of that. That's great. Thank you for bringing up that important point. Um, could you talk more about some of the efficiency gains that are seen in solar panels with the introduction of crops under the panels? Yeah, sure, I'll jump on that for starters. I mean, this is coming back to that question about where you are in the country and how hot your air is. I mean, if the air is, let's say 90 degrees outside, your solar panel is gonna be well above 90 because it's a black object that is intentionally capturing sun energy. Um, that doesn't mean that it's creating a hot island or anything around you. What that means is that it's warmer than the air. And so anything you can do, as you saw from that graph, anything you can do to cool down the solar panel itself means you're gonna be increasing efficiency. So we found that you, know, you can increase the, or you can, cool down the panel by about 10 or 12 degrees here where we're warmer and there's less humidity. And so the plants creating humidity creates that cooling effect. That translates into a 3% increase in production. How much that holds in other climates is part of this um, national network of sites that we showed where we're trying to install the instrumentation that's doing that measurement of panel temperature and efficiency throughout. So, I don't think we have a clear answer on, you know, where you live and what kind of increase in production you would see with X kind of crop. We're not there yet. That's where this is heading. Greg, I got, got a question for you on that one. How much do you think uh, solar panel height plays into that? Yeah, good question. So part of that happens because a plant that's really low is transpiring or releasing water um, up to that solar panel. Uh, we have not seen any loss at that eight foot um, installation at Byron's in terms of that transpirational cooling. As I mentioned, in fact, our panels are 10 feet off the ground here in Arizona and we still capture it. But clearly at some point that's gonna go away. Or if you're in the, um, the site where you talked about having the panels you know, 35, 40 feet apart so that you could get your tractor work through there, you're gonna create so much airflow and wind that you're not gonna have as much of an effect. So it's certainly gonna vary in all these different design constraints. But the point is that it's real, it's there, and we didn't anticipate it. And so it, I, the part I didn't talk about is the educational work that we do, just like Byron does. And talking with kids, and I think it's just as important to talk about, agrivoltaics is one climate smart or crop savvy way of you know, keeping ag here. It's not the answer for everywhere, but what we're doing is showing that really weird out of the box ideas can have all kinds of synergies that we haven't imagined. Um, and it pays to be creative. It pays to think outside the box. And thankfully um, we've landed on this one at the right moment in time. Thank you. Um, are there any solar sites you're aware of being built on Oh, say defunct factory sites or shopping centers. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of those closing and going by the wayside. Are you are you seeing solar sites built in those types of places? Yeah, there are quite a few landfills too. We have a whole section on this in the AgriSolar Clearinghouse if you'd like to look at it. Um, or if you want to specifically know, I can email you links, but they're going on in brownfields, super fun sites and reclaimed sites around the whole country. Great, okay. did you want to jump on it? I think that's right. I mean, um, with each of these places, we're trying to figure out what it means. A brown field means that the soils are contaminated in a certain way. So how can you do some type of ag or restoration on those sites that brings these other benefits? Um, thankfully, we know all kinds of science about you can grow a, a sunflower on a brown field and it doesn't mean you're going to poison the bees. So let's apply those really good practices to these places we can't grow our food 
But that also means you're not taking good farmland that isn't a brownfield out for solar. And so it's part of a portfolio, but I'm glad you brought it up. Okay, we're gonna just take, and I know that uh, Byron has to get going here. So we're just gonna take uh, one or two more questions. And don't forget uh, the websites that we posted in the chat, they're great resources. We'll include that in the email we're gonna send out to the registrants. Okay, what is your experience in working with local government to change land use regulations to attract agrivoltaic? Yeah, that's me. Um, it was um, it was great to have them as a partner. Um, when we first brought this to Boulder County Land Use Department, they said, no way. Uh, you can only have 100 kilowatts of, of a solar array system on your land. So doing a 1.2 megawatt solar array on prime farmland, out of the question. And with over over the course of time of, of talking with them about the the county's goals for having uh, local farms be profitable, uh, the county's goals for having more renewable energy, uh, folks around here are trying to go 100% renewable in the next 10 to 20 years, um, and then just talking about uh, how we want to have more local food in in, the, in our space, the county said, okay, you know th these are things that we need to think about. And over time, we got them to uh, be more amenable to us, especially when they did a calculation of how much uh, solar power that they would need for their for the entire community. And, he, and they decided that even if they coated every single rooftop in the entire county with solar panels, they would still not produce enough electricity for all the demands of the, uh, of the cities here. So they understood that they do need to learn how to put solar on more farm fields because that's that's the main type of, of non-urban land that we have in Boulder County. So that got them interested in figuring out what it would be like to have an agrivoltaic system um, on our lands. And then uh, we also pushed them to not, uh, not restrict us by kilowatts or megawatts for how much space you take up. It's like you're, the, the, the government's role is, or the, the government's goal is to conserve land. And so talking about kilowatts or megawatts is, is, is a non sequitur. It's it, maybe, maybe one day we'll have a solar panel that can be one megawatt itself. So why restrict the one panel uh, just having one panel on a hundred acre field, if you're restricted to a one megawatt system, or what if you have only 10, 10 watt panels, but they're the, still the same size. Are you going to coat the hundred whole hundred acres to be able to make up uh, one megawatt? Doesn't make sense. But it, so we've got them to think about it in terms of acres. So what they did was they limited, if you have a 70 under 70 acre parcel, you could have up to seven acres of solar array infrastructure. And then if you were over 70 acres in size, then you could have up to 14 acres of solar array infrastructure. And that helps to account for their ideas of land conservation uh, and then allows for solar array industry to um, have better research and technology on the efficiency of these panels so that you can pack more power into a smaller area. Thank you. I think we're going to go with our final question here. Um, if crop height wasn't a deterrent, do you think that C4 crops such as corn could ever be used on an agrivoltaics farm? Um, based on what we saw in Brian, or Byron's video, could planting corn strategically in spots where they could make the most of the late day sun or sun during the hottest part of the day make corn more of a viable option? I may. Um, yes, you've landed right on, I uh, see that was Ashley maybe. I love hearing C4 um, said out loud. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, it's a photosynthetic pathway that's um, corn and some other grains do. Um, yes, absolutely. Part of that dynamic light environment you saw at Byron's site is that learning by having a pilot site um, established. And we learned all kinds of things about you know, which crops don't want that morning dew when the panels drop water onto them, as was brought up in one of the other questions. Um, where would you want to intentionally put crops so that they could capture the highest point of light at the right time of day versus the wrong time of day? So corn is absolutely a possibility. There's also additional varieties 
Corn is one of those things that's been modified for thousands of years and we are actually growing um, a corn under a solar array this coming season. But it's one that's adapted to this area that's a 60 day corn. So I think part of where this is heading is as we find more challenges, um, we're finding more solutions. And so we will absolutely find ways of introducing corn into these systems, but you have to just be mindful about where you put it and what types you grow, but definitely. Wow, what a, what a great webinar. I can't thank you three enough.